Well, ladies and gentlemen, we, we didn't really uh, intend this to be a, a sort of a pro and contra debate, but there will be some elements of that in terms of my comments. Reflecting on, I think, Michael's very useful contribution, um, what I wanted to do was really to take up some of the challenge that uh, uh, Brick Rawlins said to me when he said, oh, well, you know, perhaps the hardest thing is how do you make this happen from a policy perspective in Canberra? Um, and I think that's the question you've got to ask yourself. Is it worth the effort? 2016 Defence White Paper was two years in the making. It was started in early 2014. Uh, I've said before in, in audiences, uh, perhaps even this one, in the time it took us to write the 2016 Defence White Paper, China, milita China militarised the South China Sea in almost exactly that space of time. Um, so these documents uh, can be hard to do and therefore I think if, if the idea was to say, well, um, somehow uh, R1 in Russell should think about a strategy for counter-hybrid warfare, you'd really want to make sure that you were considering this a worthwhile thing to do. Next slide. And I, I can think of a series of reasons why you would want to do that, and I've tried to sort of graphically display those there. Um, the key reason, I think, for having a policy is to get, and this is what top, uh, top left is supposed to represent, senior buy-in. Right? You want champions who have thought through this issue and are prepared to actually fight for the dollars and resources necessary to give effect to your strategy. So senior buy-in is critically important. Secondly, you need political endorsement. That is to say you need um, a National Security Committee of Cabinet which is actually prepared to put its mind to understanding the concept, deciding that it thinks it's important and then if you, if you achieve that goal, you've created a very powerful vehicle for yourself in terms of the willingness of government to back what your plans propose. Then the next value is that, well, you actually may get a war fighting strategy which delivers victory, which is perhaps no small thing, uh, quite a nice thing to have from the point of view of a defence organisation, a strategy that is genuinely built around what we think is the necessary response to uh, military contingencies is a good thing. And finally, the value you get from having a policy is that you lock in dollars and you lock in a planning cycle. So I can certainly acknowledge the failures of a planning cycle which takes X numbers of years to deliver a particular piece of equipment. But the alternative to that is often not being in a planning cycle at all. If you, if you lack the champions, if you lack the political endorsement, well then there's not going to be money that flows and a uh, kit that backs up what your plan requires you to do. So these are the reasons why you might want to develop any strategy. Next slide. And then there's a bunch of reasons why you might not want to develop a strategy. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen on SBS, there's a Chinese uh, game show, which I think is called If, if You're the One, something like that. Yeah. If You're the One. Has any, anyone seen it here? Hands up. Uh, which is this excruciatingly bad series uh, whereby these sort of no-hoper um, suitors try to pitch themselves to become the, the selected date of, you know, a collection of, uh, you know, 20... Uh, beautiful young Chinese girls. There's this guy saying, all the girls in the village want to marry me. The, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, um, if you're writing a strategy on counter-hybrid warfare, well, you're, you're not writing a strategy on something else. So you have to make sure that it is the one. You know, it, it is the concept that you think is going to be relevant to what you want uh, in terms of your planning and career for some period of time. Uh, then next, of course, you don't want it to become a t waste of time and a waste of money. Um, I've told the story of how, as a public servant in the department, I laboured for two years to try to develop a classified strategic assessment in 98 and 99. Um, the contentious part of which was it argued the case that we were seeing a deterioration in our regional security environment. And I could not get buy-in to that claim. 
Um, DIO regarded it as something of an insult because that was almost like questioning their analytical assessment capabilities. DFAT regarded it as a critique of their diplomacy and we were never able to produce that classified strategic assessment, not in 98 or 99. Um, I, I was eventually taken off that task to then go and head up the East Timor policy unit, which may have given effect to the thought that there had been a deterioration in our regional security environment, but the previous 18 months had been a massive waste of time and money. Then another reason you might not want to proceed with the strategy is that the United States literally decides, literally and figuratively decides to sail away from it, you know. So maybe Mattis has given up on uh, hybrid warfare now and doesn't want to put that. Perhaps the boat is sailing instead on uh, third offset and we should put our effort into that. Uh, and of course you don't want to have a, come up with a strategy which is simply not going to deliver you the right military outcomes. So there are reasons not to go down a policy development path for a counter-hybrid uh, counter warfare strategy if it's not going to be valuable. Next slide. I'm going to put to you what I think are six reasons to go down that path. Uh, six reasons why I think it is actually worth making the effort in the Canberra environment to develop a counter-hybrid warfare strategy. Next slide. The threat is real. Um, and I don't just mean that in the context of the Middle East. Uh, I don't just mean that in the context of um, uh, Ukraine. I, I think we're seeing elements of a counter of a hybrid warfare being applied in the Asia-Pacific region more generally. This is a, an image of a particular spat which took place involving the Japanese Coast Guard and Chinese fishing vessels near the Senkakus in uh, 2016, very recently, just a few months ago, uh, where the Chinese were very clearly using the um, uh, Chinese uh, uh, civilian fishing fleets to uh, essentially try to provoke a response from the Japanese Coast Guard. Next slide. Uh, similar story we're seeing against uh, China and Vietnam engaging in uh, spats at sea over um, disputed territory on the Vietnamese uh, boundary line. This is a Chinese Coast Guard uh, uh, going after a, um, a Vietnamese uh, vessel. Um, I could have shown you a slide of exactly the opposite uh, from the Vietnamese doing the same thing. Next slide. And again here, Chinese fishing boats banded together with ropes being chased by South Korean coast guards. And you can see this is not exactly typical behaviour of, uh, of uh, fisher people uh, attempting to uh, uh, deploy their trade. So something is going on in terms of Chinese strategy both in the East and the South China Sea which I think has got very familiar um, hybrid warfare characteristics. Next slide. And the second reason I think is well, um, so that's what we're seeing right now in terms of uh, uh, maritime uh, examples of hybrid warfare, but there are, there are obvious um, applications in terms of land warfare domains. And so this is a slightly random uh, selection of an image here of um, uh, militia in Thailand uh, pursuing an attack on Thai soldiers a couple of years ago as part of the, the southern insurgency. Now, uh, you know, it might be said that um, this has um, been contained and has yet to develop into a problem of more serious proportions, but even in the Thai context, what I would say is you see the insurgency moving up the peninsula, you see a, a political situation in Bangkok which is going to make it progressively harder to deal effectively with the insurgency. So, you know, here is an area where maybe we could see a sort of a land, Southeast Asian version of hybrid warfare emerge <laughs> in a land environment. Next slide, please. Well, and it's relevant to the Alliance. So, marine uh, helicopter operating up in Darwin. Um, I don't think we've um, sold this football field to a Chinese company yet, so it's still um, acceptable to uh, operate from a marine perspective. But clearly, if it's going to drive American policy thinking then we need to think about how we're going to operate within that uh, environment. Next slide. And I think we're seeing that operational cyber is going to be very much shaped by concepts of how hybrid uh, can not only be defended against but also used by us in some senses in that type of environment. And we had a very interesting brief this morning about precisely that type of um, 
operational use of, uh, of cyber. Next slide. Uh, regional engagement. I picked these uh, images as carefully as I possibly can. Here's the brigadier shaking hands with a friendly Japanese uh, officer. Just to demonstrate that, you know, again, I think um, if we are going to operate in the region, as our white paper says, that that's going to become a higher priority for us, well, then we need to understand how we can work with friendly and, um, and or allied partners applying similar concepts if we're actually going to deploy together. Next slide. Um, and there is also the sense of, well, what if we don't um, go down this path? Um, th that is one of the completed islands, um, the Woody Island, uh, one of the three runways that the uh, Chinese have constructed in the last uh, 24 months in the South China Sea. Um, my, my take on this story, the, the second term Obama administration completely misread what China was doing. It decided that the South China Sea was a second order priority. Um, it was just a spat over a bunch of rocks and shoals, as they called it, and therefore they weren't going to put much priority on it. It turned out to be something profoundly different. It was the construction of essentially a capacity to maintain air cover over <coughs> the South China Sea 365 days a year, which is what China has now built for itself. So there, there was a sort of a application, I think, of hybrid concepts in how China went about doing this, which we missed, and now we have to live with the consequences. So a reason for lifting the hybrid discussion to a, a policy document is really to try to make sure we don't get the next strategic surprise like this one. Next slide. So let me mention to you where I think some land scenarios might become relevant in terms of thinking about hybrid warfare. And, and I need to stress I'm uh, being totally, um, I'm sort of using scenario type concepts here to, uh, to drive these comments. I'm not saying that they're going to happen, I'm just saying these are theoretically possible. Next slide. Well, this comes from, uh, obviously, the, uh, the Timor crisis of 99, where, where I think, and indeed following some of Michael's comments, you can see elements of hybrid warfare working quite effectively in terms of Indonesia's approach to the Australian uh, um, uh, movement into Timor in, in September. Firstly, the use of uh, militias with deniable connections to um, Arbery or TNI, um, as it was then. Secondly, perhaps less widely realised, the quite effective use of Indonesian media and Tara to characterise um, Australia's initial arrival into Dili as being a sort of an example of the Crusaders arriving once again to recolonise a country. And, th and these images like that were very widely played throughout Southeast Asia. So there was a sort of a, a proto-information operations uh, campaign being developed. Now, the, the question I would put to you is, well, have we closed the book on East Timor altogether? <coughs> Will we never deploy there again? Would Indonesia ever, perhaps, uh, a different type of Indonesia to the Indonesia we have today, would Indonesia ever find advantage in pursuing a hybrid-style campaign down the border between Timor and West Timor that might involve Australia having to play a stabilisation-type task? In other words, just because we dodged a bullet in 99 doesn't mean to say that that type of hybrid campaign couldn't come back to bite us. Next slide. Next slide, please. Same deal in the southern Philippines. I mean, my, my guess for the insurgency in the south is that it's going to get worse for a number of reasons. One, because of returning fighters from the Middle East. Two, because Duterte's uh, rolling out of sort of extrajudicial executions across the country will only act as a recruitment drive to the southern insurgency. Three, because possibly the United States will be asked to remove its support from the armed forces of the Philippines. Um, again, something that might conceivably involve Australia if from that region we see the spread of a more Southeast Asian focused terrorist campaign. Next slide, please. Papua New Guinea. Uh, so West Papua has kind of gone away as a, um, as a, as a, as a bone in the throat of Australian-Indonesian um, cooperation at the moment, but that's not to say that it couldn't come back. 
there's a generation of people who will have spent a lot of time thinking about that 800 kilometre border between uh, pa West Papua and Papua New Guinea. Again, one could imagine how an adroit uh, uh, government might want to pursue a, a hybrid style campaign that would draw Australia into that environment. So, next slide please. What I want to say is that just taking three, um, not exactly random, but looking at three possible scenarios for how you might see a land application of um, hybrid warfare in the region, um, you can ask yourself some questions. Well, would, would Australia be likely engaged? I think the answer to that is yes, although we might find ourselves involved for reasons of undertaking a stabilisation task or for reasons of wanting to put down um, a potential area of um, support for, for terrorism. Would an ADF role be possible? Well, absolutely. I mean, you would be the first go-to problem solver for a government if, if it was the case that Australia was asked to engage in something like that in the region. Would, would we have, not a readership role, that's, this is my Japanese slide, would we have an alliance leadership role? Uh, yeah, we would, because I absolutely guarantee you that the uh, Americans would be looking to us to say, well, this is your patch. This is your patch of turf, Australia, if uh, we, we look to you. If you're going to pull your weight in the alliance relationship, we look to you to be providing us with some solutions to this problem. Um, and would we see elements of hybrid behaviour used against us? Well, absolutely. I mean, we did in Timor. I think that's, that's pretty clear. So I, I think this is something which does engage our interests. Next slide. Okay, sorry for the fuzzy slide. This was cut and pasted pretty quickly. I'm trying to say, challenge yourself, uh, Army, and those of you who aren't. Uh, let me talk about some of the challenges which I think a counter-hybrid strategy should have to consider. Next slide. Okay, well, um, I don't need to dwell on this for too long, but clearly the sense is that, I think, and we, we spoke about this before, uh, Changi, this sort of ethic that, you know, what we do is right, but it makes us slow versus those using hybrid who can do things that are wrong but are faster at it. And I think we've just got to ask ourselves, how do we speed this process up to give us a more decisive edge? Because there's no point going into a conflict with that council of defeat. You know, we have to find ways to speed up everything from procurement, capability development, through to operational decision making, uh, which I think is a number one problem. Next slide. Um, there is the ethical versus unethical. Um, I did ask a question, is there such a thing as good hybrid? You know, can hybrid be a force for good? Is it always going to be uh, the, 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 in the toolkit of the bad guys, but we're not able to um, draw on it in any useful way? I don't think that's true. I mean, I, I, I think part of what a counter hybrid strategy needs to do is to work out how we can sort of turn uh, the tables on our potential enemies by working out how we can use elements of it ourselves. And that, that, that's always going to be governed by law and norms and values, and, and it must be. But I don't think it means to say that we are completely unable to think about the use of it ourselves, and, and that will include things like propaganda and information operations and those types of things. Next one. Social media, obviously, good, good brief earlier this morning. Uh, I mean, this is going to be, is already the defining feature of how the next generation of soldiers and uh, the next generation of Australians thinks about themselves, uh, thinks about their lives, and is already tied into the internet of everything in such a way that um, entirely new um, attack surfaces have been created to pick away at both people and institutions. So we do have to think about social media, I think, much more from the point of view of how does this fit into the operational toolkit of commanders. Next one. Capability choices. All those uh, things that Philip uh, talked about uh, clearly impact on the types of capabilities that, that um, need, to be, need to be thought about. Next one. And I think this particularly is where we can add value. Thinking about the concept of hybrid in, in the inner arc. Um, wh why there? Because that's the place where um, 
we probably will have to lead a coalition operation, if it is a coalition operation, where we would probably have to undertake um, operations even if our big brother ally is not interested to be a part of it themselves. So uniquely we have an interest in this part of the world. And I go back to my idea about what does hybrid look like with Javanese characteristics or what does hybrid look like with Melanesian characteristics that are things we need to be thinking about in order to respond to. Next slide. And have we done it before? Um, well, yes, I think we have. I mean, what was that campaign we, we fought in Timor back in 1942 if it wasn't, um, for a period at least, a successful hybrid campaign? I, I think in a lot of ways it actually plays to what we like to think are natural Australian strengths around um, adaptability and the capacity to uh, do smart things without much in the way of, of resources. I think, I think hybrid plays to our image, if, if not the reality of Australia's character. Next. So here's my recommendations. I would develop that strategy. Um, I think it's worth it. Um, I, I can accept um, a lot of what uh, Mike says in terms of his, his comments about hybrid. Um, I think it's actually the conversation is the most important thing to have rather necessarily than agreeing it's a thing or it's not a thing, but I, I would develop it. And in the process of doing it, I would get the benefits of that formal process, the political understanding, the senior leadership championing and buy-in, the linking into the, the um, uh, de capability development process and, and money. Um, and I think it's really important to continue to exercise with hybrid concepts. I think it would be a great shame, and I'm sure it won't be the case, that in 2017, as we get into uh, talisman sabre that you know we're just going to drop that and, and everything goes back to being a sort of conventional force on force type thing. I, I know that won't happen. And engage the politicians about it. Um, regrettably this is a conversation that you could have with possibly two or three members of parliament who would have enough background knowledge to be able to have this type of conversation with you. And that's not good enough, but it's a selling task. It's something that you have to take to them, not, not the other way around. 